Welcome, Welcome Libby Manna Church family. So good to have you guys here with us. And as you can see, we are on the road. On the road. We have taking you on the road with us. And so again, we're just happy that you are here with us celebrating the Sabbath today. It's always a blessing to have you here. And we're just thankful because we're on the road, but when we're on the road like this, you know that we're with our family and with our kids, our adult kids. So we're excited to, to be with them as well, but to be with you too. So we're just happy we can be with everyone today. That's right. Uh, we want to wish you all a happy Sabbath. And um, we are doing question and answer today. Yes, we are. And some of you got the notification and have sent some, sent some questions in. And uh, we'll be answering those questions. But we do have room for you to put them in the chat if you didn't get a chance to send it in. And time allows us to do that. And as always, he's taking Bible questions. I am taking mental health questions. And for those of you who are just joining for the first time, time. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and a mental health professional. So that's why I'll be taking those type of questions. <laughs> and please put in the chat where you are viewing from. And if this is your first time, put a one in the chat. Yeah, we got a, uh, I think we always have a good church service in store. Always. Um, because of God. Because of God. That's right. That's right. But, uh, Today's message is actually going to be um, on the judgment, and that's going to be a very powerful message. So please make sure that you guys share this link with as many people as you can. And, uh, and uh, we're going to have a blessed time today receiving living manna. Amen. Yes. And I've <coughs> seen in the chat uh, that there is some of a uh, bit of an echo. So um, hopefully our tech team is working on that. You guys let us know when that sound gets better for you because um, we don't want to be echoing in your ears. Um, but please do put in the chat where you're viewing from. And again, if this is your first time, welcome. Um, but we have uh, California, welcome those in California uh, worshiping with us today. And it's so good to, to see you here. And Feliz Sabado to you too. I didn't catch the name, but that's Happy Sabbath in Spanish. So Feliz Sabado, yes. Um, for those of you who don't know, my family, well, uh, yeah, up on one side, my family is from Central America, actually Honduras. And so unfortunately, I didn't grow up speaking Spanish, but my great grandfather did then. So I wish, I wish that would have been the case. I wish I was very fluent in Spanish, but I do know Feliz Sabato. So happy Sabbath to you. Um, let's see. We have Queens, New York. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And from Janice from Belize, that's like the neighbor to Honduras. So welcome to you as well. Good to see you here. Let's see if we have any any ones. All right, Trinidad and Tobago, always in the house, as you say, but you're in the house. Thank you for being here today. Yes, literally in the house. Yes, literally, literally <laughs> with us here. Yes, Happy Sabbath, mothers. <laughs> we know we're watching. Uh, yeah, we're thrilled to be with so much family today. And again, I think there's another one from Queens, New York. So welcome. Happy Sabbath to you. Happy Sabbath, Denise Johnson. Good to see you here. Always good to see you. Oh, you are in, you're, you're on vacation in Yosemite. I hear that. Beautiful. I'm sure you're seeing all the beautiful waterfalls and man, enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself. And I see, uh, from Adventist Defense League. May as well just do a plug here. Yeah. If y'all yes, haven't. Before that, that, I just want to welcome the Netherlands. So uh, as someone from the Netherlands, which is so very far away, but we are so thankful that you were here worshiping with us in South Africa. And go ahead. So go ahead. Uh, plug for ADL Adventist Defense League. If you guys have not checked out that channel, please go check it out. No, they do not sponsor us. Please go check it out. Um, and uh, maybe just drop that in the link. Uh, if someone can drop that channel in the link. And maybe you can uh, a, bit a lot of good video. material. Yeah, so, yes. so they um they, their channel is I'm just I'm just gonna say this way their channel is dedicated to clearing up confusion about the truth. 
And so um, it's uh, it's a powerful resource. And if you ever have any questions about, you know, stuff you see online about, you know, like false information that needs to be fact checked, that's a good channel to go see, to watch because they fact check all no issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Strictly doctrinal issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I know that things have been flo floating up, people's location, um, the UK, and then I've I've missed a uh, I missed a lot while you were sharing. But we just thank everyone that is here, and yeah, let's talk about my T-shirt message. Don't want to forget. Uh, it says, <laughs> "Let's read it this way: Only Jesus can okay. turn a." Mess to them into a message, a test into a testimony, a trial into triumph, and a victim into victory. Yes. Um, this shirt, well, all my shirts speak to me. That's why I have them. <laughs> but, you know, this this shirt, just because life is always, and this is a term young people use or people use, is always lifing, meaning like you just never know what what's coming and things come out of nowhere trials come disappointments come joyous time comes all types of things but when you're in that situation where um you just think you're just stuck in a mess that you know how is this going to ever turn out to be a blessing jesus is able to turn that mess into such a blessing that you cannot see at all like you just can't see how but God has his way of being able to do that. So that's just to encourage you that if you're in a mess or we live life, so there will, if you're not in a mess now, you will be in a future mess. I mean, that's just life, right? So um, just to be encouraged and just to know that he will turn a situation into, like it says, a message. He'll turn a trial into a testimony and just be, you will be a blessing to be able to be able to share and be a light to others. And just show the Great glory power and power of God. of God working through your situation. So to use a really secular example, just to <laughs> illustrate that. <Okay>. Um, <clears throat> but there were it, a long, many years ago, there was a, a Michael Jordan commercial. And I don't know if you, you remember it many years ago where they would just do crazy things. Like they would say what they were going to do with the ball off the, Sorry, off sorry. the off the backboard, oh, right. off the wall, yeah, off the, yeah, yeah. and they would go and through I'm this whole bunch of things, and I'm still gonna hit yeah. the hit the net, and that <clears throat> kind of reminds me of that illustration. Is like sometimes you think things are going so crazy, things are going like really right. haywire in my life, mm -hmm. but God is able to take the, your shots that may seem crazy, that may seem, yeah. and He can take that mess. Right. Turn it into a message, right? right? He can take the look at the life of Joseph and you see, man, it just seemed like everything Joseph thought was going to happen, his dream, mm -hmm. it just seemed like, well, there's no way it can happen now. Right. And God takes that whole situation and brings it right back around. Like, my prophecy will be fulfilled. Will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And yeah, God's, and prophecy. God's prophecy for your life Absolutely. is, yeah, that, that sermon from a few weeks ago. And every time... I'm in this type of situation, not knowing how God is going to do what he's going to do. It reminds me of the sermon you did uh, several months ago, maybe even last year, the God of the zigzag. God of the zigzag. Yeah. That's really what this shirt, you yeah. just, you could sum it up in just that. Yeah. <laughs> the God of the zigzag. Yeah. So yeah. Amen. Yeah. He makes, he makes no sense. No sense. Turn it into sense. Yeah. yeah. And it's powerful. Amen. It's powerful to see him do it. So uh, we're excited to take your questions and we're going to pray. And then you're going to share a little bit about last Sunday evening yeah. and then going to jump right into the questions. Right. Pray, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, for everyone watching this morning, Lord. Um, we are asking that you would just in a special way, please uh, speak through us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your love toward us. Um, bless us, Lord, as we worship you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. So um, we decided um, last week, and it was kind of a last minute thing, 
<laughs> I decided. <clears throat> and it was a last minute thing. But um but yes. Uh I decided we were going to go ahead and do this um live response. Right. Uh and it was basically addressing some uh many misstatements. Um people are calling them just lies or whatever. Mm -hmm. They just were not factual. Right. So we addressed that last week. Reason. Yep. And um they the the this was Sunday night, mm -hmm. and uh, what was going to be what we thought was an hour turned out to I be be an hour. Well, but I'm optimistic. Yeah, in his prophetic time, as you guys know. as you guys know, <laughs> like <laughs> an yeah. hour means three. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, we went three hours. I think it was like three. Yeah, I think it was three hours and like forty minutes or something like that. Mm, three hours and like twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Like okay, 20 minutes. Yeah. So um, anyway. That program went really, really well, and uh, we just um, want to encourage you guys. If you haven't seen that, and you've been doing your job, you've been sharing, you've sharing been because yeah. praise God, and right. you guys are part of getting the message out there. So thank you. Yeah. If you haven't so, seen it, go watch it. If you've seen it, share it. Um, make sure you get it out to as many people as you possibly can, yeah. uh, because there's We're a watching in parts. Yeah. yeah. Unless, you, Unless guys you guys have really bad traffic where you live, you can watch it while you're in traffic or when you're driving or something. But yeah, I've talked to people. They're like, yeah, I've watched the first, like the first hour. I'm working on the second hour. I'm getting to the third hour. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. So um, anyway, we just wanted to kind of remind you, just make sure you share that. Uh, a lot of people have been sharing it already, uh, but make sure we got to get that. We, we have to get that word out. Right. So let's uh let's just uh be aware of that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> From South Africa. I think they woke up at five AM to watch that last week. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Praise the Lord and God bless you. Hopefully I hopefully it was a blessing. Yep. For sure. All right. All right. All right so, so question number one. You have you want, you want question number, number one, one or you could go first. Let's see. Uh, I never go first, but let me see. Okay. Uh, no, 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 that's fine. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. I can um get to my notes yeah. here. Let's see. Okay, guys, got to read it from my notes. Um, okay. How do you deal with a child, which is an adult now with three children that has serious mental health issues? Meaning the parent, okay, has the daughter or the, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's a daughter, it's a child, um, has the mental health issues. Um, um, this child has been diagnosed with several disorders such as schizophrenia, bipolar, and um, a mood disorder. And then she put et cetera. Okay. So that's, you know, that's, those are major diagnoses. Um, one is major, but three um, is, is major. Um, but how do you, um, and in the email you shared or when you sent that this person is, um, has been under there, has been in therapy and has, um, been working with a psychiatrist. And so, um, this child is dealing with it in the right way, this adult child. Um, but you're saying, how do you deal with this? Um, as a parent, as a, of an adult, of adult children, um, you know, there's the grand, what you can do that will be the biggest blessing is to be there for, for those grandchildren, if um, if your if your um, child or their parent has you know a, a flare up in their diagnosis and they're or they're not taking their medication or they're just not doing well, um, you are that second line of support uh, for those grandchildren. That will be your biggest gift, um, even to your child who is diagnosed with all of these um, diagnoses, because they're already dealing with these three major mental health disorders and issues. And then to be a parent on top of that is, is very difficult and challenging. And um, even with, with people that don't have these mental health diagnoses, parenting is challenging and, and, it's, and it can be stressful and all of these things. So you want to stay very close um, with your, um, with your um, child that is the parent of the children because um, these children are going to need that extra support from loving 
uh, godly grandparents, um, not to overstep, you know, it, it's going to take like a fine, uh, dance as they say, you're, you're walking a, a tight rope to make sure you're not, uh, offending, uh, the parent of, of the children, your child. Um, but also to be there for them and offering that support and just being that support that they need. Um, and even offering to, of course, be these amazing grandparents to be like, Hey, we'll take the kids, you know, let us, what can we do for you? You know, all this normal stuff that grandparents do, but especially in this situation, because, um, there's so many mental health issues, um, that the, that the one parent, uh, is dealing with. And so you're just, that's all that you can really do, but you want to keep a close connection, a relationship so that those grandchildren know that, all right, I can call my grandparents if I'm, or if I can talk to them, if I, if I need to, you know, just talk about my experience, you know, and how they're feeling in life being raised by, uh, someone who loves and cares for them, but also is, but is dealing with such strong mental health issues. You know, we're in this sinful world, so that can be very difficult for children and other family members. So, yeah. Yeah. My turn? Your turn. Your turn. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's do this real quick. Yeah. Please, you can put, you can put, in, the put in the chat any questions. questions for, for mental, if you have any mental health questions or any other, any other Bible questions that you want Pastor Myers to answer. All right, so um, there was a question that came in actually several times that uh, I did not get to answer. Uh, actually, I didn't see them uh, and it was brought to my attention. So one of the questions, the, this particular question uh, deals with the gift of prophecy. Um, how does one know um, or let me rephrase a question. The question was, will, you know, can a person still receive the gift of prophecy today? And so, you know, the Bible tells us that uh, in the last days, God is going to pour out his spirit upon his sons and his daughters, old men and old women, uh, young men and young women. And he talks about dreams and visions and these kinds of things. So the one thing that we do know is that the Bible says this this is going to be a part of a of an outpouring of God's spirit in the last days. So the question is not so much will this gift uh, will we see more of this gift, but again, how do you test this gift? Right? How do you test this gift? So uh, the Bible lays out several principles. And one of the most important ones is to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That's Isaiah chapter 8. Um, and what that is basically pointing out is that anyone who rises, who rises, who says, hey, I think I have the gift of prophecy um, may, must be tested by the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And and everything the Bible has to say. In other words, every prophet that came, whenever a prophet came on the scene while the Bible was still being written, those prophets were to be tested by the prophets that came before them. Mm -hmm. So the further down we get in time, the greater the test of, of a prophet. Because that prophet has to fall in line with everything that has been said before by the previous prophets, right? The word of God never contradicts. And so this is really something that that would take time to verify, right? Mm -hmm. If someone says, you know, I'm having dreams, I'm having visions, and I don't know what to do about it, and I'm kind of nervous or whatever. Um, the Bible also says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety, right? So <clears throat> I, I don't think you just declare yourself a prophet, God is going to make that known mm -hmm. uh, if you in fact have that gift. So this is not a, a denial that no, you know, nobody can have the, you know, can, can receive the spirit of prophecy because it is one of the gifts, right? That God said he will pour out. The, I think the key question is, and should be, if anyone arises claiming to have the gift of prophecy, how do we um, test the claim? Right. 
Yeah. Right. And the Bible gives us, gives us that, that legitimate that, yeah. test. Yes. Mm-hmm. We don't make up. The, yeah. yeah. That's dangerous. Mm-hmm. Very dangerous. Yep. Yeah. Bible, God Bible God is good for that. Yeah. To give to give us that. And I remember, tell me if I'm wrong. I think this is years ago. I mean, when I first heard it. There's 21 tests of the true is that is it 21? There, there's not a I mean, there are several tests, but you okay. may be thinking about another another study. Not something that I did. No, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, several years ago, but thank, thank you. But you could always correct me. I said, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I wanted to say, um, welcome to because I never let's see who is this from Serbia. I know we're not doing welcomes right now, but I don't think we've ever heard it had anybody from Serbia. So, welcome, welcome to Living Mana Online Church. Thank you for being here with us. Okay, and again, you can put mental health questions in, and if you have a Bible question, Pastor Myers will answer that. Okay. All right. How can you get your partner out of the me mindset and into we mindset? In other words, making decisions that are about his life, but affect both of us. Shouldn't all decisions uh, be a we thing or am I wrong? And we should make some decisions individually. Like, of course, there's going to be, there's, there's a place in a marriage, of course, to make decisions individually, um, because you are your, your own people. And, and, and so there's area, there's space for that. Like, for an example, I have made a decision. I am gluten-free. He's made a decision. He is not gluten-free. So it's like, and that doesn't mean that we don't have to be, uh, one in that way where, I'm gluten-free. You have to be gluten-free. However, that's because me being gluten-free doesn't affect him. It it doesn't, you know, it's my choice. It affects me. But when there's decisions in the marriage that, that I'm trying to, yeah, trying to make, if I make a decision that does affect both of us, then I need to consider and make that decision together with him and vice versa. Um, Because the two are one in those major decision areas. Um, And if that's not how you are operating, then that will cause conflict. Like I can't just, when you decide to get married and to be in a relationship, you're deciding to be with a person for the rest of your life and share this, what we call life space together. So you have to consider the other person. You need to, you know, just discuss things, consider their wants and their wishes. And that's what makes a happy marriage. If he was just freestyling his life and not thinking about me, uh, we're about to, we're coming up on 26 years this Thursday. I, if he did that, we wouldn't be coming upon 26 years this Thursday <laughs> because I'm sorry, not Thursday, Friday, Friday, not Thursday. Um, but because I would feel like, he's only thinking about himself. He's not considering me. And if I did that, he would just be like, wow, she's so selfish. She's not. Why do marriage with somebody who's not thinking about you? You could, you could just be by yourself instead of being in a marriage to not be considered or respected or, um, for your spouse to just think about your needs and your wants and, and just to, yeah, that's not what, that's not a marriage. That's not a marriage at all. That's not a. So, so if that is in your marriage, marriage, then that you got a lot of work. That's not a happy, happy, happy marriage. marriage. Yeah, that's not a happy marriage. Yeah, and then you have a lot of work to do. There's a lot, There's of, a work lot of work that needs done. to be done, mm-hmm. and a great place <laughs> yeah. to do that work is, of course, if both you know both parties are both the spouse, both spouses um, are wanting to make the marriage better, then marriage counseling is a very good place to to start. And of course, as Christians praying together about God changing your marriage and your mindsets. So those two places is where I would tell any couple to start. And if, again, if it's a Christian couple, then definitely with prayer as well. Um, okay. So here's one. one. Uh, uh, here is, uh, yeah, there, there's several coming in now that, uh, I'm going to try to see if I can work out which ones to get to. But uh, there is uh, one that was asked about slavery. Uh, How do you respond to someone who who disregards the Bible because of what it says about slavery and even about the treatment of women? Um, So 
the way that I would deal with a person who, yeah, the way that I would deal with a person who says, uh, I'm not listening to the Bible because it condones slavery, um, is uh, I think it's a huge opportunity to show people that, to show that person that know what the, what the Bible says about slavery is not the same thing that the slave owners uh, in the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s used to, uh, I should say the 1800s proper used, oh, around that time period, y'all get transatlantic slave trade, right? Uh, what they utilize the Bible, how they utilize the Bible to try to condone slavery um, is absolutely incorrect because the Bible does not condone what they were doing. And so people who say this often do not understand um, what was happening in the Bible. And that's a whole study in and of itself, but it requires you to actually study that subject deeper. Um, for example, in the Old Testament, if a master hit his slave, mm -hmm. the slave could, could be like, I'm out. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of slavery is that? And he was not to be returned. To, if someone was like, oh, I, he wasn't to be returned. Mm -hmm. There was no fugitive slave law right. in the Bible, right? right? So th the whole dynamic, we, we tend to read into the Bible what we experience, right? Here. What we're experiencing in our society and mm -hmm. not understanding the culture and the time. We, we see slavery and we're like, oh, how, man, what kind of God is this that would condone what we saw in the 1800s, what we saw in the transatlantic slave trade. It was nothing like the slavery. Nothing. That we, no, and there was no, and there was even a time, and I was reading this, I don't know if you said this part, but um, where the, if they owed that person, there was a time where that would end. Yep. They were just paying back a debt. Mm -hmm. yep. That was the, yeah. the, Bible, yeah. the Bible slavery yeah. situation. And there were other instances as well. Right. Um, but in fact, there was a, uh, I did a well, sermon on, it was that, slavery, was, that was not that was not yeah yeah that situation situation yeah, yeah. Where, where they were paying back a debt is what i'm thinking. they were they taken were as taken captives uh of war and there's a uh, there's a sermon that i did on this probably uh, a few maybe three or four months ago actually dealing with slavery and it might have been a sabbath school um but you did, you did a whole yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I just don't and remember just don't what remember the name, name of that. If we did it for Sabbath school or Sabbath divine school. service, but you, you should try to go back worship. and look that up in the archives. But we don't even yeah, know the name of it. Know they, the they name go... of it so I, I'm sorry, but we just went through this whole thing about you know, is the old te when when old, when the Old Testament is talking about slavery, is it talking about the same thing that happened in the transatlantic slave trade? Right. And we just went through verse by verse. Um, so that's a whole study in and of itself. But that's what I would say. Uh, a lot of people do not understand the context of what was being spoken about in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So um, there needs to be a deeper study on that to be able to address uh, those who would reject the Bible because of that. Okay, I have a mental, have a mental health question mm -hmm. that came in and just as I was scrolling, it went away. <laughs> um, all right. I can, uh oh, this is going up so fast. You guys, just bear with me. I think I, all right, well, I have it. I pretty much know what it was asking. So this person was asking, um, how do you um, continually get up and exercise? And I'm assuming that they want to exercise, they know physical exercise, they know that it's good for their their body and their mental health and even their spiritual health, their whole well-being, right? Uh, but they're having a hard time being consistent. So how do you, um, how do you, uh, you know, get up and exercise every single day? So um, this is a good time for me to, to plug Mental Health Mondays. We did a series, I think a four-part series on a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I'm not... I'm not, you know, don't get proceeds from mentioning his book, but the book is so amazing um, about changing 
a habit. So those of you who haven't seen that four part series, definitely go back onto the Living Mana Church YouTube channel and look for uh, the four part series that Dr. Ricardo White and I did um, on atomic habits. But the principle in there, the main one of the, the, the main principles is changing the system, changing the system. And so and 1% uh, change a day will allow you to have, I think it's what, 34% change um, in a new habit in a year. So just describing kind of like what that looks like, um, you mentally know like, okay, I want to exercise. I want to be healthier. Maybe you want to even lose some weight, which will be healthier for you as well, mentally and again, physically, and even, you know, spiritually, just clearing your, your mind is, is a great way with exercise, a great way to connect to God. Um, and even studying um, his word, but uh, but then you think it in your mind, but then you lack um, that that motivation. Like when you get up in the morning, you say, "Okay, I'm gonna get up and go in the gym, or I'm gonna go outside and take a walk," but you actually don't do it. So you you're trying, but you're trying to build this new habit. So you can do you can do something like. Um, where you're saying, okay, I want to walk a mile, but maybe that's too big of a thing for you to just start off with. So just make little changes. Let's say, all right, I want to start exercising and it's difficult for me to get started. So maybe you're just going to walk around the block and that's your 1% change. And then I'm going to add a little bit more to that every day or, you know, start off small and gradually get to where you want to be. Um, and, that will help motivate you because at least you'll, when you've done it, you will have felt like I completed it. And then you're like, okay, I did it once. I can do it. I can do it again. But whatever works uh, for you that motivates you, maybe, you know, um, I don't know, for some people, everybody is different, but having workout clothes that you like working out in, you know, and I know, and that's probably going to go for us women more than it is for the men that might motivate us a little bit more, um, or do the type of exercise you actually enjoy. That's huge. So he and I exercise completely, when I say completely differently, I mean, there's some of the same things in there, but he has his routine. I have my routine. His routine makes him happy and my routine makes me happy. So if I tried to do his routine, I wouldn't be as motivated or happy because it's his routine and I I like different types of exercises. So do the type of physical exercise that you enjoy because that's going to help to also motivate you. Um, I could go on and on. But again, go and watch that series on Mental Health Monday. So it's going to help you uh, where we talked about atomic habits. And that's going to, that the things that are shared there are going to help you uh, to be able to he keep your commitment for any new habit that you want to form, but for this person specifically exercise. Okay. All right. So this next question is uh, about um, a verse in the Old Testament that someone really struggles with, and it's found in First Kings uh, chapter 22 and verse, uh, um, I'm going to just read from verse 20. Actually, I'm going to read a little bit higher up. I'm going to read verse 19. So the context is this is uh, Ahab and Jehoshaphat, and they have, they're making an alliance and they're getting ready to go out um, into battle. And uh, so Ahab brings these 400 prophets who are apparently speaking on behalf of the Lord saying, yeah, go up and fight. The victory is yours. And then Jehoshaphat is like, okay, yeah. Um, isn't there another prophet anywhere around that we can uh, inquire of? So they bring Micah, Micaiah. Uh, and this is now Micaiah speaking about what these false what these false prophets have said, which is, hey, go ahead and go fight. And here's what it says, first, first Kings 22, verse 19. And he said, hear, there, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall? at Ramoth Gilead. And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. 
And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of, of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets, all thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. Then it goes on to say, but Zedekiah, the son of uh, Chanana, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? So what's happening here is that Micaiah is... Well, the, the issue that, that the individual has with this verse is like, man, did the Lord send a lying spirit? And, you know, when you're reading it at face value, you're like, man, is the Lord out here like deceiving people? So remember the story of Job when, when Satan comes before the Lord and he is saying, I, I, you know, if you allow this, you allow me to do these things to Job, I bet you that, right? In other words, he's saying, I know he will curse you to your face. So we do have though that example in scripture where uh, Satan will come, would come before the Lord and then be allowed to do X, Y, and Z. But here in this case, it's not necessarily what's happening. From my understanding of this text, Micaiah is simply relaying to Ahab that your prophets are lying to you. They're claiming that they're, that they're speaking on behalf of God. But God has put a lying spirit in their mouth, meaning they are not telling you the truth. And of course, he doesn't listen, and he goes out and gets killed in battle. So if you think of this more like a almost like a prophetic parable where Micaiah mm -hmm. is saying, your prophets are lying to you. They're not telling you the truth. And it's almost as if Micaiah is saying, you all better not go because if you go, this is what's going to happen. And they reject it. And of course, uh, Ahab dies. So um, my answer to, to this specific question is not that God is intentionally sending out people. Um, I like how third angel Bible soldier to it, to put it, God sent them a strong delusion in a sense. He's saying, you're, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm letting you know this is what's going to happen. And they chose not to listen to him. And sure enough, that's what happened. So God is not the author of a lie. Uh, the Bible says God cannot lie. And God will not encourage a lie. Uh, but Micaiah is telling him your, your, your prophets are the ones that are lying to you. That's what's happening in the text. And then you can read commentaries on it. You kind of see what the different commentators say about the text, but most commentators are in agreement that, that this is, this was a message to Ahab that your prophets are lying to you, which he didn't listen to. Okay. There's some good other, good other Bible questions that are coming through too. I saw one about um, the be somebody who's who yeah. is just beginning to study the word. I didn't get through the whole question, so you might go back and look. But it looked like it was like really good. Something that needs to be answered. Um, uh, let me say this. Okay. Like Pharaoh, <laughs> when the Bible says that uh, he hardened Pharaoh's heart, mm -hmm. it's not that God actually hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's Pharaoh in rejecting God harden his own heart. Right. So a lot of times you see the way these, you know, phrases are put in the Bible and you're like. And that goes back, I was hearing that with a young, hearing that with a young person this morning, actually, that goes back to just, I mean, giving that as an example, like the foundation. And I say this, I've said this many times on here before, understanding the character of God as your filter for your Bible study. Mm -hmm. Because when you don't like see something like that, you'll be like, what that don't like like, how, how could he why would he do that and but he you know what i'm saying like so if you understand the character of god then you can go you can be like all right let me this is looking weird to me so let me yep. use my filter because i know the character of god to figure out what that really means mm -hmm. so 
All right. All right. All right. And I have, okay. Um, and again, you can put in the chat Bible questions and mental health questions for me, and we are going to do our best to answer. So this is uh, one that was put in the chat. Um, so for years, I've been dealing with trichomania. I, I pronounced that right, which is a mental health issue. But even after um, I've been converted, I still have the issue. I don't want to disclose to a psychologist. So um, two things with this. Um, first of all, even after we are like with mental health issues, and, and I just want to deal with this, this premise that once you're converted, you no longer have mental health issues. Now, granted, don't get me wrong. Jesus comes into our life and he gives us uh, strength and power to, to deal with to all of our issues, um, mental health issues, they vary on a spectrum, right? Some medication is very helpful. Therapy is very helpful. Even as Christians, like if you like, let me back up, I'm going ahead of myself. Even as a Christian, I just want to deal with the premise that I am a born again Christian. I shouldn't have mental health issues anymore. That's not the truth or reality. We don't see that in the Bible. As we give examples of Elijah, this was God's man. He was doing big things for God, miracles and things like that. He dealt with depression and mental health issues. So as if you, if, as anybody would, if they went through what Job went through. So I just wanted to deal with that. So that's like the first part of that. Um, for, some, for those of you who don't you know, know what this disorder is, so it deals with um, picking and pulling like at your hair. Like, like you know, I knew someone um, once, I won't even say how I knew them, but because I don't want to give that type of description. Um, but they had like this teeny little bald spot at the top of their head um, because for years, this person would just pull and pull and pull and they couldn't stop. Um, it, and um, so that with this disorder that falls in under the umbrella of OCD, okay? But it falls under the umbrella of OCD because of the anxiety that's connected to it and they can't stop doing it. It's like a compulsive thing. Um, but the OCD disorder also is connected to multiple layers of trauma. Now, a psychiatrist and um, or a psychiatrist, a psychologist can officially diagnose somebody with these disorders. Um, and so speaking to this person who wrote the question, if you are still struggling with this um, disorder, I would, you know, say that it would be beneficial to get a mental health professional that um, specializes in trauma. Because I believe that um, uh, these, it's not just I believe, um, there have been studies that have been done to connect um, this disorder, OCD, things that fall under OCD, connected to OCD, are also connected to unresolved trauma. And so you would be doing yourself uh, a favor and it would be beneficial to uh, the underlying issue that is causing you um, to suffer with this disorder. So, um, and then the second thing is they, in this question, they said, I don't want to talk to a psychologist. You need to be talking to a psychologist and a psychiatrist and even, you know, a psychologist or a therapist or whoever you need to disclose to and be working with your mental health professional. They're here to, to help you. Um, and that's to get a help by a mental health professional. You have to disclose what's really going on or they can't effectively help you. So hopefully all of that was, was helpful. All right. Okay. Um, so next question, the question that I'm going to address here, and I think I can probably do like two here because one of them is going to be a pretty quick answer. So the question, one question was, was there a side door through which the scapegoat uh, was taken out of the sanctuary on the day of atonement? So the Bible doesn't tell us that the scapegoat had to be taken out a specific place. It just tells us that the scapegoat was taken out uh, of the temple. So there was no specific door designated for the scapegoat to be taken out of. So that's question number one. Uh, question number two, 
uh, I was going to address um, the spiritual meaning of the wheel within the wheel in Ezekiel chapter one. So if you're unfamiliar with the vision, Ezekiel sees a really, really complex vision. And it is, I, I think it is perhaps the most intricately detailed picture that is painted in the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, it, to me, it's hard to even imagine what Ezekiel is, is trying to describe. But in part of that description, he sees a wheel within a wheel, their eyes. I mean, it's just a really, like I said, it's a vision that is just out of this world. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is there some kind of spiritual significance to this wheel within the wheel? And the one that most often comes to my mind is that while the picture looks like chaos, mm -hmm. it is extremely organized, right? It is extremely organized, meaning it kind of goes back to <laughs> God can take a mess, it, it turn it into a message. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's showing how God's hand is moving and working through what seems like chaos, mm -hmm. right? What seems when things don't seem to make sense, God is calculating god is precise god is working in ways that we our minds cannot even fathom that to me is the biggest lesson one of the biggest spiritual lessons about this wheel within a wheel is it looks confusing to follow it is overwhelming to the mind it looks like confusion and yet it's organized i'm not going to say organized confusion and, but some of you, you know, y'all will understand the reference. It is absolutely organized. So when you think confusion is happening in your life, and if you're trusting in God, think about the wheel within the wheel. And say to yourself, okay, I, this does not make sense to me, but the wheel within the wheel, the wheel within the wheel. <laughs> no, no, no. I will. Yes, I'm. I'm monitoring the chat so I can get more questions. But um, you're going to come back to that. You're about to mention. Well, are you? No, were no, you no, down? No, no, were you done with your answering your question fully? Okay. Um, well, yeah. This is not a question. There's been some comments, and again, still taking a few more questions um, before our time here runs out. But there have been statements, and I'm going to say something that I've said on Mental Health Mondays, I've said it here, and you know, it's always good to say it again if if, 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 it, if the, if some are still, you know, battling with this. Um, but there are people who are, who are saying, yes, it needs to be, um, let's see, let me, there are counselors, um, there, it, basically it needs to be a Christian counselor. Or it needs to be someone who, um, has they're saying basically you shouldn't go to somebody that doesn't have any uh dealing with the word of god or those kind of things um so i always say this it if that is your preference that you want a christian counselor you have all the freedom and the right to to do that right however i just state this and especially some people come to me like oh i wanted to talk to you because you were adventist like, let's think, okay, we're going to use God's, the filter that of God's character and what's go really going on. So there's what, 18 million Seventh-day Adventists in the world? So I don't think, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't personally know a hundred Seventh-day Adventist therapists in the church. Now, I'm not saying that there are not, I don't know everybody, but I'm just trying to show that compared to 18 million, that, that people not, maybe not all 18 million don't need a therapist. I think everybody could be blessed talking to a therapist about just life or whatever. However, um, I say that to say you, de you don't, and I've said this before, you don't have to have a seventh day Adventist counselor. You don't even have to have a Christian counselor. Well, why do you say that Atante? Because therapists are trained. This is how they, they drill this in to therapists. Um, it's even part of the ethical uh, rules and regulations that we, we have to um, practice by is that 
we have to be sensitive to our client's belief system. And we are not to put our personal belief system or anything. So they do that with, you know, for spiritual beliefs. And even we have to um, actually be sensitive to all the different cultures. Because see, my culture might be different than my Korean client's culture. So I need to understand their culture. So I need to give therapy through the lens of their culture. So I'm saying all that to say that that is how therapists are trained, but therapists are just like, like a doctor or whatever people you go to, to get a service that therapist may not work for you or fit for you. So you can always just keep shopping around. Not every therapist fits for everybody, but they are not to put their, like, say you're talking to a therapist that, I mean, as an Adventist, even if you get a Christian, they're not going to believe in the Sabbath like you do. They're not going to believe in the state of the dead like you do. They're not going to think that the you know, they don't teach the health message. You see what I'm saying? So like, you're not going to be able to match with the therapist on all these different levels. You just need a good therapist that has empathy for you and that can help you work through your difficult experience, whether that's depression or anxiety, or you're going through grief or whatever the case may be. Um, and so I just say that because I don't want that to, I, I'm so passionate about that because I don't want that to stop you from going to get a therapist. Because you're like, well, I need to be talking to a Christian only, okay? Or I need to be talking to an Adventist only. If you can, you know, that's just from what I know of the field, I mean, I'm not saying there's all therapists are amazing. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that therapists or, or mental health professionals are just supposed to be there to help you through your situation, not put their belief system or to indoctrinate, indoctrinate you to believe what they believe. So you don't have to be afraid. If you feel like you need therapy, go find a therapist. I always have to do this plug. People always ask, where do I find a good therapist? Go to psychology today put your zip code into that search engine. You can even say, you can even put, do a filter. You are looking for a Christian therapist. You can do that. You can look at their profiles, find somebody that sounds good to you that you think would be good for your situation. That's it. That's my rant for that. Okay. Uh, so this next question is more of a, I think it's a personal, uh, not it's not a personal question, but it, it was directed to me. So uh, someone asked uh, if I'm going to do a, a study on Project 2025 because there's, you know, some uh, SDAs who are now talking about Project 2025. So, huh? Many SDAs, the whole country. Country's talking about Project 2025. Yeah. The, yeah. News, the news blows it up. But, but praise God that other SDA leaders are doing that too. Yeah. So just so that you know, I've been talking about Project 2025 since... Or the beginning of last year. Yeah. And have done several presentations on not just Project 2025, but the whole The Elephant in the Room series. If you haven't seen that, please go check that out because I'm dealing with, and Project 2025 was not even happening, which is crazy. Wasn't even, it was being written and we didn't know about it, but it was not. Uh, it was not yet made public when we were doing the Elephant in the Room series. Even when we were doing the specific Project 2025, 2025 last year, year, it was not it was not well known like it is now either. Yeah. And for me, I mean, that was the first time I was really, I was like, it sounded crazy to me then. And now everybody's talking about it. And I couldn't believe that there was a 900 page uh, document stating all of these things and that they really believe that they can do this. And now it's just very prevalent and everybody knows about it. So is this such a, <laughs> it was a blessing. I mean, honestly, I don't know what made the people who did this want to, okay, yeah, you wrote it down, but you actually let people know about it and, th and to think that no one was going to have an issue with that. So it was almost like, you, I mean, it's not a good thing, but if you really wanted it to happen, yeah. um, it, you would have kept it. It would have been wiser to keep it a secret, but I'm glad they didn't. Yeah. So everybody can know. Yeah. Um, and let me go, let me go to the, to the, cause someone just said, stick to a Christian therapist. I have two family members who were messed up bad because of, because of, um, uh, yeah, I guess going to the wrong therapist. Um, and yeah, you, that can, happen. that can happen. There's not every, just like there's not, there's not 
not, not every doctor is a good doctor. Yeah. Every therapist is not a good therapist. And it's not, I don't, I have seen, it's not because you. I've seen bad Christian therapists. I've seen bad regular therapists. I mean, that are not Christian. So it, that doesn't make it them good or bad. Bad Christian therapists. Right. That, yeah. right, right, right. That's what I said first. Bad so, Christian therapists. Yeah. And the, want to make sure that uh, the person that you're speaking to is really giving you correct, you know, uh, solid counsel. And, and if you're looking for a uh, spiritual therapist, uh, sorry about that. If you're looking for, 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 if you're looking for spiritual counseling, come to Living Mana. <laughs> Can't get, I mean, well, you can get some. We're not, I'm not. If you come to Living Man, and you'll hear some yeah, yeah. stuff on mental health by Dr. White and myself. But we're not your mental health professionals. But I do want to say this, and this is just to, because I'm be honest. Before I became a therapist, and um, we were looking for um, some mental health therapy for a family member, it was very confusing and where to find them, how to find them, who's good, all that stuff. But what you can do is many therapists, and they'll say this in their profile, like you can do a a, a 15 minute cons consultation, a free consultation, interview your therapist, call them and ask. I have people do this to me. They call me and they like ask me all these questions because they want to know like, okay, where are you coming from? How do you, you know, like they just want to, they want to interview me and I'm fine with that. And you should do that. If that, and if that therapist isn't open, open to that, hmm. <laughs> because, and I learned that not from a supervisor I personally had, but a supervisor that was in the program that I was working with. And he had been a therapist for years and extremely successful one and gave, always gave every client, uh, that opportunity, that free 15 minute consultation. And uh, he was just very successful. So I just really believe that, you know, as therapists, we're, we want our clients to be transparent and we can be transparent on how we lead out in therapy um, so that they can feel comfortable. Because you want, we want, or the therapist should want a client to feel comfortable. And that bond has to take place, that therapeutic bond has to take place with the therapist and the client for therapy to be really successful. Uh, all right. So someone, um, just, uh, and I don't, I don't know the context of the question, but they were asking, do I need to be SDA to be saved? Do I need to be seven day Adventist to be saved? So, um, and thank you for, uh, for sending that, uh, Kashif. Thank you. Um, Kashif didn't ask a question, but someone else asked and Kashif just, just sent me a message and said, look out for that. Um, so I'm going to address that actually in the message that I'm preaching today on why so many Christians are afraid or reject the, the investigative judgment. Um, and it's, it's not because of the date. People aren't rejecting the investigative judgment because we connected with 1844. That's not the reason. That's the reason many people will use, right. oh, it didn't happen in 1840. You know, that's not the reason why Christians reject it. We're going to get into that. But um, let me say this. In heaven, there will be people who are Catholics, who are Baptists, who are Methodists, who are Seventh-day Adventists, and we can go down the list. In the destruction of the wicked, there will be people who are Baptists, Catholics, Seventh-day Adventists, mm -hmm. Methodists, mm -hmm. and you can go down the list. Yeah. You are not saved by what denomination you are in. Right. We believe there is a biblical denomination. We believe that there is a movement of truth. Mm -hmm. We believe that there are that there are doctrines that are true and that there is a body that holds those doctrines. But just because you are a part of that movement doesn't mean you're saved. And just because you may not be a part of that movement doesn't mean that you are lost. God judges each individual based on the light that they have and what they do with it. Right. So and their connection. 
That's right. That's right. That, that, that's, that's what that's determines what your connection with God. Right. What do you do when light is revealed to you? Right. right? Mm-hmm. So there are people who who may be living in doctrinal error all their lives and never knew better, never heard anything different. Right. A lot of people, one of the reasons why a lot of people reject, and I'm gonna bring this up again, but one of the reasons a lot of people reject the truth mm-hmm. is because of their love for friends and family members that are past. Yeah. Right? Well, if that's true, well, what about my right. my aunt? What about my great 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 uncle? What about my right? right? What about these people that I loved? And what about and they what? Didn't know this. Yeah, what we need to understand is that God judges people not based on the totality of light, mm-hmm. but He judges people based on the light that that person has. Mm-hmm. So, if a person, you know, I'm, I'm just going to put this in percentage percentages, you know, mm-hmm. just for illustration but if one person has 10 percent light mm-hmm. and it's living up to 10 percent light mm-hmm. and another person has 90 percent light but is living up to 60 percent of that light mm-hmm. those are two different i mean the person with the less light mm-hmm. is walking in mm-hmm. the lord right while the person with more light is just walking in more condemnation because you know the truth, but you're not walking in it. Right. And the whole point is not knowing truth. It's walking, walking in, it. in it. And when I say that, I'm, I want to use the example of there's people who know truth and are the meanest people Absolutely. on the planet. Um, and that's very unfortunate. And so knowing truth is not going to save you. Yeah. Knowing truth and allowing that truth to um, to work in your life and connect you to God in such a way that you're just you know you're in love with Him, you understand His love for you, and you you just want to go deeper and deeper in that. And you're just it's yeah. So knowing truth, just because you're a Seventh Day Adventist and you know the truth about the Sabbath and you know the truth about the state of the dead and hellfire and um, all of those things. That doesn't save you. Yeah. Now, you are looking to understand if you're saying, hey, I need to, I, I need to, I need greater light and I need to walk in it. And um, again, I don't know who asked the question, but um, um, you want to learn more about uh, what Seven Day Adventists believe, then please, please, please reach reach out to us. Yeah, definitely. And there's a good question question here, just somebody asking a good question. What does Seventh-day Adventists mean when they refer to the history of the church as a movement? Say that again. What do Seventh-day Adventists mean when they refer to the history of the church as a movement? Yeah. Like we say, like, this is a movement. Yeah, it, yeah. it's... How do I explain that? You know, yeah, go watch the blueprint, <laughs> right? Watch the blueprint, watch the blueprint. Um, so when we say that we're not, you know, what we say, we don't say we're not a denomination. We are a denomination, but we consider ourselves a movement, meaning there's a very specific mission, right? We're not just existing just to be like, oh, we're different than this people or different that. There is a mission that comes with this move, with this denomination that you don't, typically find uh in in a lot of other churches a lot of other churches it's there's you know it's just like hey we're a church and we're waiting to get to heaven now in evangelical christianity that's a movement right in a certain sense there is a movement afoot to establish america as a christian nation so they they are actively pushing not, not all evangelicals but they're actively pushing christian nationalism there's a mission that they're trying to accomplish for america right for the world well in the same in a similar sense adventist seven day adventist is a movement because there's a mission that we are seeking to accomplish in the world there is a reform that we are seeking to bring to the world we're not just existing just to be like, hey, we exist. We're we're the new denomination on the block, you guys, you know, since the 1800s. No, there is a mission and every Adventist should 
understand that mission and be a part of that mission. And our movement, just to parallel since you brought up mm -hmm. that. Brought up that know, evangelicals have a movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody, all Christians want people to accept God as their, as their, as their savior. Right. And, you know, um, but in the evangelical movement, they want to make America uh, a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to make or force, I should say, um, or enforce laws that make people do that. And so that is not what we as Seventh-day Adventists believe, mm -hmm. um, that it's God gives them the freedom of choice. We want to share with you the gospel and share with you the great things of the Bible um, and how amazing God is. And we want you to choose. You have a choice. God does. He gives you that freedom of choice. Yeah. yeah. And, and our, the our, the pro, and our mission knowledge. is to let the world know yeah. what is coming biblically, that too. what is coming prophetically. That too. And that, forcing. and that this forcing. is part of it. Yeah. This whole yeah. Christian nationalism mm -hmm. is part of it. We have been warning. We have been warning about this since our inception, right? right? Mm -hmm. Since the beginning of our movement. And so anyway, that's that's why Adventism is a movement. When you hear people say derogatorily, like, oh, we're not a denomination, what they're actually trying to say is we're not even Christian. Uh, and yeah, I'm not going to jump all back all into that yet. But this last uh, on Sunday, when we when we did that thing, that was the first time I'd heard that. Though. Yeah. I guess you've heard it before, but yeah. that was the first time I heard it that we weren't a denomination. Yeah, it's a new yeah, thing. It's a new thing. I guess so. Several people, Several people have, made, made, have made, you know, you know videos against Adventism. Oh yeah, they're not even a denomination. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Means. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'll do one more question. Okay, and that will be our final question. Yeah. So, yep. So okay. someone is asking, so, so how did so, Jesus fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles? So I, I'm gonna be very careful because. I will be doing a presentation on this very thing uh, in uh, within the next week, week and a half. And I don't want to give away too much, so I'm trying not to say too much. But let me just say it this way. Jesus has not fulfilled the Feast of Tabernacles. Not He's fulfilled the Passover. He's fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He's fulfilled the, the uh, Feast of First Roots. He's fulfilled Pentecost. Mm -hmm. He's fulfilled the the spring festivals, uh, of which there were four. But there are three festivals that were the fall festivals, um, trumpets, Day of Atonement, tabernacles. I'm just going to stick on tabernacles right now. Jesus has not fulfilled the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, please note, there were sacrifices that were made during the Feast of Tabernacles, which point to Jesus. Mm -hmm. But the Feast of Tabernacles was not fulfilled when Jesus died at the cross. So the short answer is he did not fulfill that yet. That is still yet future. But that key, that while there were sacrifices during the Feast of Tabernacles, which point to the cross of Christ, mm -hmm. that the feast itself is not fulfilled mm -hmm. and will not be fulfilled into the future when the Bible says, behold, the tabernacle of God will be with men, meaning at the end of the 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. That's when the Feast of Tabernacle is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. That gives us a very important insight into something else that we will be discussing In a few weeks. that has to do with the Day of Atonement mm -hmm. in a few weeks. All right. I will leave it there. Yeah. Yes. Well, stay tuned for the more in-depth answer. So the person who's asking that question, and for the rest of you who want the more in-depth answer to that question, definitely stay tuned uh, for Pastor Myers to announce when that will be happening. And I will say that that will probably be on Power of the Lamb yeah. YouTube channel. So if you want notifications for that, you'll have to be subscribed to Power of the Lamb. But we also want you subscribed to Living Matter Church YouTube channel. So yes, definitely stay connected. Uh, stay connected with us. So that was that's our final question for today. And I, um, all right, I think, I believe we have a second reading. I have to do 
Um, do you have that name pulled up? Because I will have to scroll through uh, so from our from our church clerk and secretary. I think that was, uh, yeah, you scroll and get that one. <laughs> do some closing remarks. Yeah, because we definitely want to read our newest uh, vote for our newest member to become a member, an official member of um, Living uh, Mana Church. And let's see, let's see. And we're, yes, this is it. Yes, this is it. All right. So, but we're going to pray, close this out, and then go into our membership transfer. Uh, Lord, the question and answer session, we thank you for the, all those that have tuned in. We continue to pray, Lord, that your presence would abide with us, Lord. And as we seek to get to know you better and uh, that you would draw us closer to you, Lord. And uh, please be with us as we enter into our divine service, Lord. And again, Lord, we thank you uh, for your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yes, we, yes have we have a second reading. Um, and this is uh, for Regina Halliburton. And she is transferring from the Brownsville Seventh-day Adventist Church um, in Brooklyn, New York, and is wanting to transfer to the Living Manor Online church so this is the second we're going to entertain a motion um to accept regina into fellowship at the living manor online church uh so we will uh entertain a motion and then if there is a second um we will then go ahead and vote so you can put that there in the chat there in the chat so we've got a motion and uh, we'll take that as a second as well. So we've got a second. Um, so let's go ahead and vote. Put a one in the chat. Uh, if you would like to welcome Regina into Fellowship at Living Mana. Um, and the ones are coming. Amen. 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 <laughs> All right, and Regina, you are already being welcomed. All right, the there we go. Amen. 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 Yes, All lots right. of welcome, lives. you, Regina. Uh, glad to have you as a part of our online church family. We are excited. Excited, and uh, Regina. Uh, Regina, if you're not already a part of a small group, uh, we definitely encourage you to. Uh, be on Mighty Networks to look for the small group that you want to be a part of because your church family community is there waiting for you if you're not already a part. And uh, we're so thankful to have you here with us. And for those of you who um, are like Regina and want to become a member of Living Mana Church, um, I'll be able to give you more information about that during the Divine Worship Service so that you uh, can um, you can do what you want to do, which is become a member. <laughs> so again, Regina, welcome. So glad to have you here. All right. Yes. All right. So uh, you should say again, today's sermon, why many Christians um, reject an investigative judgment. Uh, we're going to be taking an in-depth study, look at the word of God and what it has to say about judgment and you're going to learn some very powerful things, I believe. So make sure you share this link. Let people know, uh, your friends, uh, your skeptic friends, whoever. Bring them, share the link, and we'll see you soon. Yes. All right. See you in divine worship service. Continue to worship with us. God bless. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Nature does not hurry, and yet everything is accomplished. 
Never have I really seen the reality of this truth until I had the chance to visit a place that's far off the beaten path. A region of our world that's hard to get to and even harder to leave. An inspiring land that has gripped the imagination of thousands ever since its first visitor set foot on shore. A world of wonder, an island of intrigue. The first recorded visit to this enchanted place happened by chance in 1535. It was the Bishop of Panama who stepped foot on this undiscovered land after accidentally finding it on his voyage to Peru. The Bishop was amazed to see the rich diversity of this untouched domain. He was entertained by birds with bright blue feet bobbing up and down in their clumsy courtship dance. He was intrigued by the swimming and sunbathing iguanas laying on the sharp black lava rocks. The white sandy beaches were filled with lazy sea lions basking without a care in the full strength of the noonday sun. He was surprised to see penguins perfectly content living in this equatorial region. But of all the birds of the air, the fishes of the sea and the beasts of the field, that which caught his attention the most were the giant tank-like tortoises covered in their armored shells. To the bishop, the shells of these ancient reptiles looked like the Spanish Galapagos horse saddles of that era. So he named the tortoises Galapagos. Then when the Flemish mapmaker Abraham Ortelius published his world atlas in 1570, he referred to these islands as Los Galapagos, which means islands of the saddlebacks. And so has this land of wonder been called ever since. The tortoises that give this place their name are some of the rarest creatures on earth. Exploited for their meat and oil, the population of the Galapagos tortoise has been decimated from 250,000 in the 16th century to around only 3,000 in the 1970s. Five out of the original 15 different species are already extinct. The remaining 10 are on the endangered list. Now federally protected, these ancient islanders live the easygoing laid-back life. With no natural predators, they are free to come and go as they please. Consisting on mainly a plant-based diet, these gentle giants can grow up to six feet long and weigh up to a whopping 800 pounds. With a generous appetite, they can eat up to 80 pounds of food per day, and they can survive a whole year without eating or drinking anything. They are the longest living reptiles on Earth, with an average lifespan of over 150 years. They carry their home on their back, and they graze wherever the grass is greener. Most of the time, taking them up to the highlands and even to the crest of the volcanoes, they're not afraid to venture to higher ground if that's what it takes to survive. There are so many amazing characteristics of these grass grazing gentle giants, many of which it will be well for us to emulate in our own lives. Characteristics that will improve longevity and enable us to outlast the elements. The Galapagos tortoise teaches us, be blessed and don't stress. Wherever you go, make yourself at home. Rest well and take long walks. Don't settle for the lowlands, but head to higher ground. But take it one step at a time. Be hard on the outside, but soft on the inside. Chew your food carefully, but stick to a plant-based diet. Save and store for times of want. Be flexible and adapt to your environment. And if you run out of sustenance, be patient and use what you got. Have no enemies. Be at peace with those around you. Remember, you may be slow, but you are rare and unique, and there is none that is quite like you. Live your life in such an impressive way that one day people will name an island after you. Many are the life lessons we learn from these majestic creatures. But of all the lessons, the one that sticks out to me the most is this. Many times slow and steady is better than fast and gassed. Sometimes we live our lives in the fast lane, and we miss out on all the beautiful scenery around us. We invest our time and our energy trying to reach a specific destination, trying to attain a certain goal, and yet we fail to enjoy the journey. 
we fail to embrace the process of what it takes to get there. Human beings have a natural tendency to seek instant gratification without considering the long-term results. Many pour out their lives in trying to make a living, and yet they're not really living. We work hard to attain and accumulate, and yet we struggle to find genuine lasting peace and satisfaction. We are outwardly stimulated, and yet we're inwardly dissatisfied. Our bellies are full, and yet we're still hungry. And our discontent with what we got drains us of life, and it robs us of peace. And if we continue to live in this mindset, we will eventually run out of gas when it matters the most. Now don't get me wrong, there's nothing that takes the place of a good work ethic and a strong ambition of wanting to live a productive life. But the lesson we learn from these ancient saddlebacks is this, slow and steady is better than fast and gas. So don't rush into things and don't procrastinate your goals. If you wanna live long, you must first live strong. And if you wanna outlast the elements, you have to take it one day at a time and one step at a time. So let us be like the ancient saddlebacks of Galapagos. May we be the rare and unique ones that people flock to see. May our modesty and simplicity be our strength and longevity. And if we do, perhaps one day someone will name an island after us. But until then, let's just keep heading to the highlands in faith. And by God's grace, I'll see you at the top. We hope you've been blessed and inspired by this new Reflections of Hope episode. This episode is one of many that's been produced all over the world. If you haven't done so yet, please give our video a like, share it with your friends, and please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you'd like to see more inspiring episodes and get access to much more uplifting content, please go now to patreon.com forward slash revelation of hope and sign up to be a member of our Patreon page. Your monthly support will not only give you early access to many more inspiring videos, but it will also enable us to continue to produce more of these cinematic object lessons from nature. Our goal is to produce and release these episodes much more frequently. So please prayerfully consider partnering with us so that we may continue to share the hope of Jesus all over the world. Thank you so much for your support. Aloha and Maranatha. Our bellies are full and yet we're still hungry. And... <laughs> it is better to live slow. It is better to go slow and far. <laughs> They're not afraid to venture to higher ground if that's what it takes to survive. Have no enemies and be at peace with those around you. There's nothing that takes the place of a good work ethic and a strong ambition of wanting to live a... And a... <laughs>